Welcome to my review of Red Alert 3, the third video in my series covering the entire history of Red Alert. If you'd like to watch my videos on the previous two games, there are links in the description. The fourth and final video will be coming later, which will be an in-depth look at the development of the whole series, from the original Westwood days to the final hours under the banner of EA to now, where the brand sits on the cusp of a potential renaissance. If you're interested in that video, subscribe so you don't miss it. Red Alert 3 was developed by EA Los Angeles and saw its release in October of 2008, nearly 8 years to the day after Red Alert 2. It's a sequel many people probably never thought they'd see, after series creator Westwood was unceremoniously shuttered by EA in 2003. By 2008 EA LA was no stranger to RTS games. In years prior, they'd cut their teeth on the Lord of the Rings, the Battle for Middle-earth 1 and 2, and they were undoubtedly eager to prove that they could continue to do right by Command & Conquer, one of the most renowned real-time strategy series the world had ever known. Their initial outing with Command & Conquer was at Generals, and followed up by that was Command & Conquer 3 Tiberian Wars, the third entry in the mainline saga in the direct sequel to Tiberian Sun. And while it was well received on its own, and my personal favourite entry in the series, Many still hold the belief that it doesn't hold a candle to its predecessors, generals included. As for Red Alert 2, it's regarded as one of the best RTSs of all time, and the task to create a sequel that lived up to its legacy was no easy one. But EA Los Angeles were up to the challenge, and both Red Alert 3 and its eventual standalone expansion Uprising enjoyed a mostly welcome reception once they were finally released to the public but it still received its fair share of criticisms, despite the positive sentiment overall. But we will be the final judge. Time has passed and opinions have settled. Context has been given via the dismal release of CNC4 and the excellent quality of the recently launched Command & Conquer Remastered. So let's take all of that, bundle it up, and assess Red Alert 3 with the last 25 years of history in mind to answer this simple question. Should you play it in 2020? I am no stranger to the campiness that we've all come to expect with Command & Conquer. Ever since the 95 original, the series has owned its B-grade charm and ran with it, to the point where it's one of the most defining traits of its single-player campaigns. And let me tell you, I thought I'd seen it all. From the complete wackiness of Red Alert 2, to the campy, yet dark tone of Kane's Wrath, and whatever the f this was. But Red Alert 3 is an entirely different beast, unique in its presentation in more ways than one. It begins with the familiar, World War 3 is in full effect between the Soviets and Allies, as it has been with both previous Red Alert games, albeit all in different realities from one another. Hence how they can just keep redoing it over and over again. However, this time things are different. The Soviets figure out if they go back and remove Einstein from the temporal plane, Allied technology won't develop to the point where they could defeat the Soviets. So they do just that. And while indeed limiting the Allies' capabilities, the change in history allows the Empire of Japan to rise as the world's third superpower. And that sets the stage for Red Alert 3 and its now three campaigns. Third superpower, three campaigns, Red Alert 3. <clears throat> anyway. They can be played in any order, and while somewhat interconnected, each will lead to a different conclusion with the faction you've selected eventually being victorious over the others. There are four extra campaigns included in the standalone expansion Uprising 2, but they all assume an allied victory has taken place. So keep that in mind if you'd rather keep your own Soviet victory headcanon intact. All the stories are presented in that familiar tone you've come to expect, but Red Alert 3 stands out because of that big EA money! The list of big name actors and actresses is impressive on its own. More President J.K. Simmons please. But the detailed sets and computer generated elements make for what's probably the most bombastic and visually impressive Command & Conquer campaign ever. Everyone owns their roles and all radiate that signature CNC tone and charm that you love. One complaint is that it's a shame that, as far as I know, there's no returning actors or actresses from previous Red Alert campaigns. It would have been some welcome fan service to see Yuri from Red Alert 2, or the President from Red Alert 2 show up in a little cameo somewhere or another. Some characters have made the jump between games however, like Tanya, but she's portrayed by a new actress, and she did an okay j, j oh no. 
Graphically, Roulette 3 is really, really nice. It's a Sage Engine game after all, so if you're a fan of the effects and visuals of Command & Conquer 3, or Battle of Middle Earth 1 and 2, you're sure to be happy with what's available here. And despite being 12 years old, some things really do stand out. Particle effects for one look excellent, and things like smoke, fire, and reflections of all things are on a similar level. I mean look how these missiles reflect off the ocean after they're launched. Great stuff. And in classic Command & Conquer fashion, unit design is outstanding. The list of mechanical units is more diverse than in previous games, with fewer tanks, APCs, and trucks, and more mechs, multi-role vehicles, and various naval vessels. In the past, both Red Alert and the Tiberium Saga have featured some pretty awesome looking units, such as the Nod Avatar here. But in Red Alert 3 it feels like every unit has had some real time put into it with the intent of making it stand out in one way or another. And it's supported by incredibly high quality animations that I think are easily the best in the series. I love seeing these Japanese helicopters deploy and land on the ground, and how the stingrays sprout legs and clamber onto shore. Even just seeing them perk up as you select them. The level of detail is impressive and it shows a really solid amount of dedication from the development team who put this all together. Unfortunately, it's not all good news though, there are a couple of things that detract from my love of the visuals. Firstly, I'm really not a fan of this thick outline given to whatever you have selected. It makes things look a lot more cartoony than I think they need to be, and it's especially noticeable with buildings where it makes them look like they're levitating somewhat and not even touching the ground. It's not a huge deal and it's something you get used to. But something that you don't get used to is the game's lock to 30 FPS. It's the same with all Sage Engine games if you remember, so unfortunately this is nothing new. But it's just such a disappointment to see it here because I think the effects would really shine at 60 FPS or higher. The game's graphics are permanently shackled to its frame lock, and as far as I know there's no reliable way to fix or change it. And to put a bow on that, I couldn't help but notice some things that were animated at what seems like 15 FPS at most, like these collapsing trees and rotating harvesters. It's a weird thing, I know, and I don't really know why they're done that way to begin with, but they stick out like a sore thumb and it really seems like something that would be easily fixed. Right, moving on, soundtrack time. How much 3, need I say more? But no, in all seriousness, Red Alert 3 soundtrack ranges from really good to just okay, in my opinion. While Frank Klopaki did return to create some tracks for the game, such as the newest and best, in my opinion, rendition of Hellmarch, the majority of the rest was put together by Timothy Michael Wynn and James Hannigan. Between them there's credits on games like XCOM 2, Total War Warhammer 2 and Super Smash Bros, so these guys are no amateurs, and overall I do quite like it. The Soviet March main theme is a particular standout, but some of the tracks fall into what I'd call background music territory. But to be fair, there's not many games you couldn't say that about, so while the music isn't as iconic as previous entries in my opinion, it's no slouch either. When EALA were tasked with making the sequel for a game as influential and acclaimed as Red Alert 2, I can imagine there were some difficult decisions made in the company meeting rooms regarding how they would move such a game's mechanics and systems forward while staying close enough to keep what people loved so much about that particular game. Luckily, they already had experience with Command & Conquer 3 and Junior's beforehand, and I'd say most would agree that EALA were successful in bringing CNC out of the 2D age and into the third dimension. What eventuated in Red Alert 3 is a game that at its core feels very similar to Command & Conquer 3, but features enough individual traits to have it stand apart from both it and its predecessor Red Alert 2. Of course the developers weren't going to rip the backbone out of Command & Conquer to make this new one, not yet anyway. So the basic mechanics of Red Alert 3 remain the same as they have really since the first Command & Conquer. Build a base with a mobile command vehicle, power it with reactors, and harvest a singular resource until you have enough strength to wipe your opponent from the face of the earth. But beyond that, Red Alert 3 actually makes some pretty significant changes to the gameplay formula, most of which I really like. The first, which ironically I actually don't like, is changing how resource harvesting works. Now there's set stockpiles on the map, rather than fields that you can harvest and build around from anywhere. 
I don't really get the potential gameplay benefits. It just feels more limiting to me, and to my eyes it's a strict downgrade. But it's no huge deal, and it's nothing compared to the stuff I do love. First up is the increased naval presence, both in terms of units and base building. For the latter, almost any building can now be constructed on water, as well as land. This allows for entire bases to be completely offshore, if you so desire, which may prove easier to defend or attack from depending on your situation. And to go along with it there's a greater variety of water based units than in previous games, making naval combat a lot more diverse and enjoyable as a result. Some fan favourites make a return, like the classic allied combat dolphins, and there's some awesome new ones to go along with them, like the Soviet Stingray, as well as the Japanese multi-role submarine fighter planes. You know, these ones from the trailer. Speaking of units, the renewed naval focus has led to a ton of Red Alert 3's vehicles having multiple roles, such as being amphibious or being able to land on the ground after launching in the air. On the one hand, I really enjoy the diversity, and definitely not just for the cool animations. The gameplay implications are significant, and it allows for units to excel in different roles with variable strengths and weaknesses that can be changed on the fly. But on the other hand, it did lead me to rely on these jack of all trades units more than normal, and overall my army diversity suffered because of it. But that's more of a me problem, in the end I'm only hindering my own performance. Something else Red Alert 3 does really well when compared to other Command & Conquer games is faction diversity. Of course it has an inherent advantage due to the fact that there's an entirely new third faction in the game, bringing along its own unique units and abilities. It's similar to how Red Alert 2 added Yuri, or how Command & Conquer 3 added the screen. But Red Alert 3 actually goes further than both of those games. All of the three factions are now more unique than ever, with each having their own ways they construct buildings, their own individual ability trees, and super weapons that all cause some level of great destruction, and obviously all the units and building types that come along with them. Diversity is extended even further with a laundry list of fancy new unit abilities. Nearly every unit now has a special ability to be used, varying from something like a temporary fire rate increase that slowly damages the unit in question, to a one-off sphere of electricity that shocks anything in a small radius. All the factions feel like they've got their own thing going on, and there's less similarities between them compared to what I've experienced in other Command & Conquer games, Red Alerts 1 and 2 in particular. With variety being the word of the day in this review, I'll use it again when describing the game modes available, the number of which is surprisingly significant. Starting with the campaign, all three of the core storylines can be played in full in co-op, which is awesome. Each mission features an ally on the field with you, and if the spot isn't occupied by a mate, then the AI takes control of them instead. And they can be ordered around to a limited degree. It's a welcome mechanic that extends to skirmish and multiplayer too, which is given some extra life by actually having your partner talk to you periodically throughout a match. Commander Giles reporting for duty, sir. You've got the Allies' finest Air Force backing you up now. Your enemy does the same too, by the way. A nice way to give some character to a simple skirmish game. The power of the Soviet Union is unmatched. But that's why you're here, isn't it? And there's more. If you're playing Uprising, the game's standalone expansion, there's four new mini campaigns as well as a challenge mode that's similar to what was seen in Command & Conquer General's Zero Hour. Unfortunately though, all of the new content in Uprising is single player only, so you'll have to tackle those alone. Hey, at least the new units are pretty cool. There's a bunch of ways to enjoy the content of Red Alert 3, which is already quite the offering on its own. And it's honestly more than I expected, especially for a game this old. If you're worried you won't get your money's worth, you can put those concerns to rest. Whether it's solo or multiplayer, it's got you covered. If you're more interested in the latter though, you'll want to know how to actually take part in it, as there's no official servers being kept alive by EA. That in a second, but first, mod time. actually trickier. Like most Command & Conquer games, Red Alert 3 has no shortage of community mods available to expand the game. But unlike in other videos, I'm going to cover them in more detail in a separate video, as there's more than a few I want to have a crack at and I would really like to give them all a fair shake. And frankly, I don't want this video to get too long. So look out for that sometime in the next wee while. There will be a link in the description once it's released. And if you know any good mods in particular, leave them in the comments, I'll be sure to check them out.
As Red Alert 3 and Command & Conquer 3 are built off of very similar frameworks, everything I talked about in that video can pretty much be copied verbatim for this one. So I won't spend too much time on this section. Starting with purchasing, you can thankfully still buy Red Alert 3 and its expansion through Origin, as well as on Steam. The asking price of 20 US dollars each seems a bit steep for me and prefer them to be offered together in a bundle for that price, but as Uprising is standalone, it's a little bit easier to swallow, if you just want to play that and have no desire to play Red Alert 3. And while there doesn't seem to be any obvious compatibility issues in terms of system specs or operating systems, there is in fact no official multiplayer support like I said. EA did shut down the servers a while back now. Luckily, CNC Online is here to save the day this time around, and offers its own multiplayer services for you to take part in if you so desire. Keep in mind you do need to own the game legally to do this, but even if you have a disc version or you just own it digitally, it'll work either way. It's also worth noting you can still play LAN games too, so a service like Game Ranger or Hamachi would work if you'd prefer to take that route. Or just use an Ethernet cable like the old days. Whatever's easier for you. If I asked you in 2007 if you thought a sequel to the acclaimed Red Alert 2 could live up to the lofty expectations set by it, I'll bet most of you would have said no. And depending on who you ask today, you'll get a range of responses trying to put that question to rest. The definitive answer of is Red Alert 3 as good or better than its predecessors? And to throw my hat into the ring, I think the answer is no, it's not. Red Alert 2 was a revolutionary game for both the series it was a part of and the genre it championed. It pushed gameplay forward, laid out standards that would continue to be adopted for years to come, and put to rest any doubts that Command & Conquer wouldn't fade away into obscurity after being overtaken by younger and flashier IPs. Throughout its life, CNC has seen the death of countless strategy series, and it still holds its relevance today. And that accomplishment almost certainly would have not been possible without the door-busting success and subsequent influence of Red Alert 2. When you look at it that way, it would be nearly impossible for Red Alert 3 to pull off a similar feat. No, RA3 is not better than one of the most acclaimed, successful, and defining strategy games the world has ever seen. But you know what it is? A darn good game in its own right, and a genuine homage to the forebears that made its existence possible to begin with. Red Alert 3 is a blast to play, and its campaigns in particular are the real standouts in my opinion. It totally owns its campiness while taking itself seriously enough to not have the story feel unimportant and just leave it on the wayside to go to waste. And the advancements in gameplay make a solid case for having the game exist to begin with. And while not everything is executed on perfectly, the effort is there and it shows the developers really did put thought into how they could advance the series. They didn't want to just phone it in and write off the name alone, and it shows. The only real disappointment is the game engine's technical limitations. Being stuck at 30 FPS really hampers it in both gameplay and visuals, especially for those who are used to playing games at a high frame rate. If it doesn't bother you, trust me when I say I'm jealous, because personally I found it hugely distracting and a real blemish on what I personally think is an otherwise really great real time strategy game. Thanks so much for watching. Like I said at the start of the video, if you'd like to watch the other videos in this series, then there will be links in the description once they are all complete. And if they aren't there yet, don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell to be notified when they go live. Also, if you'd like to follow me for updates on the channel and future videos, take part in community votes on my next projects, or just ask me a question, then you can do so over on Twitter. I've been casually streaming a bit here and there too, so if you're interested, feel free to check me out on Twitch. Thanks again and I will see you all next time.